Thanks for coming out at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. I know I don't want to be here. So, uh, you don't either? Gordon and I appreciate your presence. My name's Tim Wick. Uh, I am one of the people who helps organize this convention. I've known Gordon for many a year, many year. I think I think our initial contact was festival, right? Yeah, we, yeah. we were both out at the Renaissance Festival in the 80s. Yes. I know. Sure. A legendary decade of which many of you have no memory. But of course, I, I think my first year was 84. And mine was 85, but you quit and I am still there. So. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to hold it against you. <laughs> it's all right. I, I hold it against myself, even though I should. <laughs> uh, and since then, our uh, orbits have frequently. Uh, come in contact with one another, and uh, right now I'm writing a show. I'm head writer of a yes. show for Gordon that we're kickstarting on Kickstarter, which is where you kickstart things. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because if you were hard. if you were, were, were going to go fund me, you were going to do you do that and go fund me. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to interview Gordon. Uh, There's comedy here uh, somewhere. Uh, <laughs> You people are generously laughing, and it's because, like me, you are sleep deprived, and that's all right. I will take, I'll take it any way I can get it. All right, that sounded bad. And, uh, so uh, I'm here to interview Gordon about being Gordon. He is, of course, one of our amazing Convergence 2015 guests of honor. How has your guest of honor experience been? It is, Gordon? it is a wholly narcissistic experience. Yeah. That it's, it, it, there are people who literally volunteer to spend the entire weekend sucking up to you. Yes. And have they, have they achieved their aim? Have they done a good job? Have they sucked? <laughs> <laughs> no, they have not sucked. They have not sucked. In any way, shape, or form. Um, um, the, uh, yes, Carly was, uh, okay, uh, I'm a late riser, and so, uh, this morning, I was waking up, my, my wife, my wife is an early riser, so she goes out and she forages for food. So the first thing that happens this morning is Jennifer walks in and says, I got your peanut butter jelly sandwich. And so it, I'm laying there in bed and there's a peanut butter sandwich right here. And so that's what I had for breakfast. Um, but then I was, I was like a grumpy bear, got up out of bed and, you know, was getting dressed and, and uh, I was just like, I can contact Carly. All right, can you bring a iced mocha to the <laughs> da, da, da. like it? It on my crappy little phone. It took me longer to type the message than it would have to just come down and get an iced mocha, but <laughs> she did it, and she did it with a plum. So there it's it is. That's a plum iced mocha. Yes, it is. Okay, um, but. It, it, it's been very nice, and I, 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 I thank, if this is being recorded, I'm sure, I thank everyone on the ConCom for having me in uh, as a guest. Uh, I, I've been at the convention every year. Yeah, you've been since the, since the beginning. Since yeah. the beginning, mm -hmm. since, since the great Minicon crash and uh, the rising like a phoenix from the ashes of well, Convergence. And MarsCon. And MarsCon. Yeah, so there, it, there were two phoenixes. Yes. The rose from the ashes, and the other thing that rose from the ashes was, I guess, uh, still Minicon. So, yeah. lots well, of Phoenix. I was really trying to be Minicon, I think. So. <laughs> because, was, you know, there, there are people who just don't want it to change. So, you know, they, that's well, good. I, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad the guest of honor experience is agreeing with you. That is, that is uh, great. And uh, that means that every convention from now on is going to be worse for you. Yes. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see. Because I mean, people suck up, just not as much. Yeah. We don't get that awesome parking space. We don't get the awesome parking <laughs> space. That's the best deal ever, isn't it? It is. It's, it is. it's like, hey, you want to go out and drive somewhere and be able to park when we get back? Yes! I actually had a, I, I had a call from somebody on uh, Friday in the middle of the day. She was on a panel in the middle of the day, and she was trying to find a parking place, and she'd been trying for like an hour. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and like every time she'd like find somebody getting ready to pull out and she'd sit there with her turn signal on and then uh, that person would pull out and somebody else would snipe her parking spot. Bastard. Yeah. Bastard. If you're one of those people, if you are one of those people, 
uh, you're horrible. You're horrible. Just, yes. I mean, you're wicked, um, evil, terrible. We need to. So, Gordon, what you're best known for, I think, to our convention audience, is Transylvania television, and in in specific, and puppetry in general. So, I think what I ought to ask you is, how did you get into puppetry? Um, I think I wasn't paying attention one day, and it hit me over the head and dragged me into a dark corner and made me its bitch. Um, that Which, given, given that puppets are soft, means it, it didn't hurt that much. No. no like, like everybody, I was into puppets as a kid. I mean, you know, we all grew up on the Muppets and Sesame Street and Sid and Marty Croft and, and all those great TV things, which is kind of why I land in the TV world of puppetry. Um, I really, I, I hate rehearsal. And so, <laughs> so when you're filming something, you only do it until you get it right and then you move on. So that's, I like that. I don't, I, you know. Not having to do several shows a day on the same show um, is very handy for me because I'm really bad at remembering lines. So, um, but, you know, as a kid, you're really into puppets. You think they're cool and they're fun. And then you get into high school and then girls happen. And you go, oh, puppets aren't cool for the moment. Maybe I'll come back to that. And then, uh, then you work in special effects for 25 years, and you get tired of that particular ulcer. And uh, you go, you know, if I decided to, I could probably make a business out of puppets. And that's what I did. Um, you know, it was it, it was a it was a pretty classic burnout that I had on the job that I was doing. And Jennifer was kind enough to say, you know what, you need to quit, quit, because we can't do any worse. So wow, well. <laughs> It's true. Special I, effects, living the dream, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a practical effects guy. Sure. So, uh, you know, a vast majority of that work is now being done digital. And mm -hmm. there were several panels on it uh, here, I'm sure. Um, and uh, just the practical effects work just does not pay like it used to. And so it was getting pretty tight. And I, I just decided, you know what, if I'm going to spend this much time and energy worrying and working I'm gonna do something of my own you know instead of instead of trying to make someone else's dream come true I'm gonna go make my dream come true and I trust myself to make money by making things and selling them mm -hmm. instead of trusting someone to pay me for a lot of work that I've done and to have that weird separation of you know um, am I getting paid this week am I not getting paid this week uh, that kind of thing. So, I take on I take on that responsibility myself now, as opposed to letting someone else tell me whether or not I'm getting paid this week or not getting paid this week. Um, and you would think there's not much difference, but there is. There's a universe of difference. Um, owning owning your own situation is so much easier, and most people don't believe that, but it is. I I sympathize. <laughs> having having, just having decided having to recently made the, the uh, decision to do so myself, mm -hmm. and uh, owning the fact that I'm not getting paid on a regular basis. So, uh, it, did you find uh, when you decided, okay, I, I want to be a puppeteer? Um, did you feel? Did you find you had a, a natural knack for it, or or did you really have to practice? And I mean, of course, you had to practice and practice to get good at it. But did you find that, that your learning curve might have been a little shallower than others? Um, a little bit, yeah. Uh, the thing is, I have, well, when I was younger, I was a really good parrot. Um, I was good at copying voices and, and that kind of thing. And I've kind of lost a lot of that talent. But um, early on in life, you know, I, I discovered that doing what the Muppets were doing was fairly natural, I could do that. And uh, hitting, hitting a lip sync and, and all those sorts of things. Um, and then, uh, you know, like anything, you've got to practice at it. Uh, but uh, I just naturally gravitated towards that sort of entertainment. So uh, I watched a lot of it, and having watched a lot of it, I was able to mimic what, what I was seeing on the screen. Um, one of the more one of the more tricky bits of that is, uh, well, like I was saying, the lip sync part. A lot of people think that when you're doing a puppet, you need to hit every syllable, and that's not true. 
Um, if you watch Jim Henson puppeteer, he's constantly skipping syllables. He's he's you know there he's losing them in in between because if you're constantly hitting every syllable, your puppet mouth is going crazy and wild, and you, it's very very difficult to watch. So you want to kind of skip some things and keep it a little calmer so that the audience can see the eyes of the puppet and can, you know catch the features of the, the character. Who is this hand character we're seeing for the first time? Um, naked puppet. Oh. <laughs> naked puppet hand. <laughs> puppet hand. Hand puppet. <gasps> I'm naked! So uh, did you, obviously you were working for MinFX, you were producing practical effects. Did you start producing puppets while you were with MinFX? Was that a hobby that uh, that just kind of arose from, I'm gonna play around with puppets, so I need to make myself some? Yes. Um, what's, let's see, what the first thing I did? Um, through MinFX, we did a couple of industrial video things for a company called IASCO, Industrial Art Supply Company, and they supply um, like plastic stuff and that sort of thing to schools for the plastic shop or the, you know, the uh, aeronautic shop or whatever you want to, you know, whatever the class is. And uh, they wanted a series of videos um, explaining how certain processes work, so injection molding or blow molding or vacuum forming or, um, what was it? There was another one, I think it was uh, model airplanes or something like that. Stuff that would be really interesting if it was explained by a puppet. Yes. Ah. Mm -hmm. So we did, um, I think, a series of five videos featuring these puppet aliens. Uh, one was named Private Tutor, and then there was Colonel O'Truth and <laughs> General Knowledge. Um, <laughs> don't blame me for the material. I just, uh, you weren't the writer. I was not the writer. Yeah. Um, and so I puppeteered all these puppets uh, individually against a black screen. We weren't using a green screen, we were just using a black curtain. And uh, they were cut out and dropped into a digital background. And uh, the, you can still buy these really bad videos. <laughs> They're awful. Um, part of the reason is because uh, when, when, it, when we made the puppets, um, I wasn't actually building puppets at the time, and so we had a gal come in who had some experience doing it. And the puppets that she built were incredibly heavy. And so, you know, I don't know if anyone has tried before, but walk around with your hand in the air holding a brick and see how long it lasts. Because within a minute, your arm will be tremoring. And then within two minutes, you're probably gonna start sinking. And then you know you you start losing control of that muscle uh, that muscle muscle yeah, muscle <laughs> as Popeye came in for a second there uh, muscles yeah um, but uh, uh, so these puppets were really heavy and uh, the the best thing that a director can know when they are working with puppets is you need to rest your puppeteers constantly. Um, and uh, the, the thing is, we were, we were under a deadline and uh, uh, my boss was being director, in quotes. And so I pre-recorded all the dialogue and so I was supposed to be just kind of puppeteering this, these characters to the dialogue that I had pre-recorded. So he would play it, he'd turn on the camera, I'd start going, but some of the lines were really long. And so after a while, I mean, I was just getting rag arm. I mean, it, it, there was, I didn't have any strength left in my arm, so instead of hitting a lip sync, I was just kind of like flopping the mouth, and like, <laughs> like those old HR, HR Puff and Stuff episodes where he's just kind of bouncing around hoping the mouth moves, and it just looked awful, and, but you know, the boss didn't care. And uh, at one point I said, you know, this just isn't working. And, and he actually gave me the speech, you know, this is, this is a dream for you. I could walk out there on the street and get anybody to come in here and do this. <laughs> I was just like, oh, please. <laughs> find my guest. Find right somebody. now, you go out, you find somebody right now. <clears throat> Be my guest. Uh, but, uh, so that was, that was the first thing I did. And even though it was a very painful experience, I loved it. And so, you know, I, I started cooking on the idea of possibly doing something new. Um, the, the next thing that came along 
I met Mike Peagle here when he was a guest at Convergence while he was doing his movie Planetfall. Mm -hmm. Which and I think would have been 2000 that he was a guest. It was a while ago. Yeah. And so he, I, I went to his presentation and usually when you watch people who are doing an independent movie, you can immediately tell, okay, these guys got their shit together or these guys are going to fail horribly and they're going to take a bunch of people down with them. And I looked at Michael and I watched how he was operating and I said, you know what? This guy knows what he's doing. And so after the panel was over, I went to him and I said, you know, <clears throat> I work at Special Effects Place. I can do props. Let me know if you need anything. Mm -hmm. And almost overnight, Jennifer and I were making uh, space guns and costumes and little hand props and all that kind of stuff for his film. After that was over, um, Michael was at our house and he saw Furry, Acker Monster, the orange, the orange right. guy. Yeah. My orange Yeti character. Are we going to close up on that? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, uh, he saw Furry, and he saw a very nascent uh, Count Lashock puppet. Mm -hmm. and, and it was just it was just kind of a blue body and didn't have any clothes or anything. And he just said, have you ever thought about doing any film with puppets? And I was like, oh, hell yeah. I just, I'm not a film guy. I don't, I don't run a camera. I don't like things. I don't do sound. So I don't like things. <laughs> <laughs> light, light, oh, light, 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 light. That's different. Um, but uh, and so we immediately started collaborating on doing Star Trek first. Oh, that's true. Yes, we did. We did the little Star Trek sketch yeah. for opening ceremonies, which is hilarious. There is a video of that somewhere. There is a video of that. I, in fact, it might still be on YouTube. But yeah. um, we made um, an entire. There, there was a video that was made of the entire opening ceremony sketch that I think is on YouTube. Although I don't know where you could find it. Um, Convergence. 2003 or four, I think. No. But um, that little sketch that we did, it was a Star Trek thing, ended up getting rolled into our pilot episode for Transylvania Television. Yeah, so you just go ahead and buy one of those fabulous Transylvania Television discs, probably number one. There you go. Actually, it, is, um, it might be on number one. Yes, it's on number one. Uh, the prettiest work that we've done is these two discs, uh, the Beast of Transylvania Television and the Halloween Special, because this is this is when we were actually in our prime and we, you know, had gotten kind of things under control. Um, <coughs> the first two discs are all of our web content, and so a lot of it is pretty raw. Some of it's kind of crude um, in both material and execution. Um, but by the time we got to our Halloween Special, we really Hit a hit a stride, and uh, we're we're working very very well. Everybody was working well together, and um, we were moving through. I I think typically you'll do when you're filming, you'll do a couple of pages of dialogue a day, and that's a good day. If you mm -hmm. if you can cram in three four pages of dialogue in a day, you're doing really well. Mm -hmm. um, at our stride, we we hit I think it was ten pages a day. That's pretty impressive. We did 20 pages in a weekend. And so, I mean, we were very happy because that was just this major load off of the schedule. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it just, I mean, we had a really good weekend. Um, you know, typically when you're working with puppets on film, you're, uh, you hope that things work. You can plan ahead of time, but everyone is operating and acting by remote control so things tend to go wrong um, the one time we tried to do a sketch where uh, one puppet handed something to another puppet this is a big fail never ever do that <laughs> just don't bother find a way to do it off camera because it, uh, you, you will fail again and again and again we wasted almost an entire day trying to film that one shot and Eventually, that sketch just got canned. We didn't. Everybody was so disgusted <laughs> at, at our failure trying to get a hand a puppet one thing to another. So, um, but uh, those characters were were rolled over into something else. Um, 
try magnets? Um, no, we did not try magnets. That would be difficult though, because the first one's more known to a magnet than the other one is, and yeah. they get linked to their stuff. Yeah, um, we, we, did, we did all kinds of stuff, and, and we even had, the thing, that, the thing that was being handed over was like this weird devil cattle prod, and so it actually had like a, a control rod attached to the, just the prop. And we just, we just could not get our, um, our action together. You know, one puppeteer's over here and he's got a puppet with arm rods and someone is in the middle holding that little rod of the prop and trying to pass it. And then the, the, uh, the other puppet is trying to, you know, accept that thing. And three was there ever was there ever like a shot where you're like you, you do it and you're like we got it and then you watch the replay and you're like oh, crap yeah Charles's head was in the shot <laughs> and that was that I don't think it was Charles it was probably Laszlo was that was that the time after that shot was that when you gave up it's like the head in the shot when you're like we did it perfectly and we screwed it up we're done we're done I I don't know I that that, that day just kind of went down we at the time uh, we had started. <laughs> We started shooting Transylvania television where I used to work. So we had a big workshop. Mm -hmm. And uh, nice yawn. I love to keep my audience riveted. Um, uh, this is my fault, not yours. Yeah, okay. I'll accept that. Um, so we, we used to shoot at the business that I worked at. Um, and uh, eventually that became a problem. So we started looking for other venues to shoot in. Now, you wouldn't think this is a problem until you realize that we had like castle wall sets and big props and things like that that would have to be transported. And uh, we tried shooting at a couple of different places, one of which was a still photography studio uh, that was loaned to us very generously over a weekend. And we kept blowing the fuses, you know, because you, you've got these big power sucking lights and then we discovered that the place wasn't air conditioned and it was middle of summer, so we were all just baking inside this space. So yeah, it's hard to believe those lights put out a little bit of heat, huh? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you're and well and then you're underneath a table with other people. <laughs> so you know <laughs> dressed little, in black. Little yeah, little BTUs happening and uh, it was just it was miserable. And I think that was the day that um, that was the day we realized we needed insurance for production. In case somebody died? Um, somebody well, somebody fell down the stairs. Somebody fell down the stairs of the studio. And, huh. and it was just immediately, it was like, ah, <laughs> we probably need to be insured against this sort of thing. Everyone's here. Now, I wasn't really worried about it because everybody was there and everybody was operating in good faith and goodwill. Um, but when it comes to injury and money, always, always be covered. Even if you're working with friends, always be covered. Um, because friendship is, is a fragile, fragile thing when it comes to money. So, um, that, that, yeah. is, that is depressing but true. Yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, you just ended up being into puppetry and you, now you, you, you make a living by building puppets primarily and, and, and not, not necessarily uh, performing with puppets, but uh, can you tell us about some of the puppet build, build work that you've been doing or have done that, that is really exciting or interesting sure. or fun? Um, a real big break happened a couple of years ago with uh, the Minnesota Lottery. Mm -hmm. um, I had, I had worked with adver the advertising community for many years, uh, and one day I get kind of a contact. Uh, some people are looking for puppets, Muppety style puppets to do a commercial spot with, uh, and they are doing it for the Minnesota Lottery. Um, the Immediately you kind of, uh, as Americans we go, oh, puppets, well that's a kid thing. So what, is the lottery trying to sell to kids now? What's the deal? Hey, what are the kids gonna do with that allowance money except buy gum? Yeah, well, yeah. But uh, really what it, what it came down to was they decided they were going to use puppets not to sell their product, but to do commercials that were called the beneficiary spots. 
Now, a lot of people always wonder, you know, where does the money from the lottery go? I mean, yeah, they roll it over into the, the uh, prize, but, you know, we allow the lottery to exist in our state because uh, a lot of that money goes towards the environment and education and lining pockets. Um, we don't really like the lining pockets bit, but, you know, it happens. So, uh, like yours, yeah. Um, so they decided they were going to produce some spots, and what they wanted was uh, a very Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas feel to it. And in fact, the, the storyboards that they gave me were all uh, still frames from Emmett Otter's Jug Band, Jug Band Christmas. <laughs> they just like pulled them off video and dropped them into their little framework. Uh, but so they wanted a bunch of kind of crazy little forest critters. And so we came up with a list of characters. And in six weeks, I built 15 new puppets. I, did, I designed the set, and I designed all their little instruments that they were playing as a band. And I built a miniature environment with a little tiny log cabin for the establishing shot uh, of the spot. And that was a really, really, really intense, but good six weeks. Um, I doubled my, uh, my money that year yeah. on that one spot. Um, and it was, it was good and it was fun. It also got me in touch with a gentleman named Tim Lagasse, who uh, directed the spot. Uh, he's a puppeteer. He's currently living in LA. He was uh, Crash on Crash and Bernstein for the Disney Channel. Um, but also, <laughs> he's worked on Sesame Street. He's directed stuff for them. Uh, but he's a great guy. And so that was a, that was a very valuable connection. Um, Plus, it also got all of my puppeteer friends from Transylvania Television some work. So we all performed, and if you see the spots, I think you can still see them on YouTube. There, uh, we have uh, guest starring guest starring Bert Blylevin and Kent Herbeck from the Minnesota Twins. Now, originally, they had planned on having somebody like Prince, and, and they then wanted, yeah, they wanted that, to get Prince. I'm, I'm sure that 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 just worked. Yeah, they well, called, they called Prince's people. They tried, they really tried, but in the end, you know, it was the, the twins guys that they could actually get a hold of. Um, and uh, each, each one of those guys did one day uh, of shooting, and there were two different spots. Um, actually, the interesting thing about that was I, I built a little miniature cabin with the landscape and stuff for this establishing shot, and they, they set it up beautifully, and they, they shot the shot wonderfully. But uh, we knew that it was going to go uh, from a summer to a winter scene. Mm -hmm. Because for, for one spot, they were going to do a summer thing, and for the, another spot, they were going to do a winter thing. So I set it up so that that miniature could be winterized. And I told them, when, when, we, when we go to do this, it's going to take us about two hours to go from this summer to winter, because we've got to put all the snow in, and we've got to dress it in, and we've got to dress out all the trees. And, and that kind of thing. And so uh, we get on set and they've shot the summer part and uh, we break for lunch. And then after lunch, uh, the producer came over and said, okay, so you're gonna get that, that winter thing set up, right? I'm like, yeah, sure, it's gonna take about two hours. He's like, no, you got a half an hour to go. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, I, didn't, I didn't just randomly say, I'm gonna take two hours. It's like, this is, this is a physical process. It's like, you know, paint drying. You know, you can, you can force it, but it's gonna dry at, at a rate that it's gonna dry at. Um, and he said, no, we need it in a half an hour. How, how many extra hands do you need to make this happen? Well, it's, it's also not something that, you know, you can just throw a bunch of people at. It's, it's you, a person with absolutely no experience with this prop. Yes. Come over here and have me explain to you. And do a finesse job at making it into winter. And so I, I ended up with two other people, and we just started slinging baking soda at it. <laughs> um, and it, it, it worked out. It worked out. We covered it in baking soda, and I had a few minutes to kind of do some finesse sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, that, that kind of thing happens on set all the time. You know, suddenly you realize, oh crap, that those two shots that took an extra 20 minutes a piece to get have now eaten up our time for something else. You've, got to, you've sacrificed that, those, those 40 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
But yeah, that was that was a fun. It was a very fun shoot, and a lot of uh, it was it was also a musical piece. So they kept having to play that music track over and over and over and over again. So and, and the there stuff are times, nightmares ever since. There are times when the stress is high that I hear that song again. <laughs> it just never goes away. Yeah. Um, cool thing that happened on that shoot. Um, one of our puppeteers was not extremely experienced, but he had been doing, doing puppetry before. And he wasn't, um, none of us had really puppeteered to a track before. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, most of us took to it okay and, and everything was fine, but he was having a little trouble with it. And unfortunately, his character was center frame. Mm -hmm. So he was not hitting the lip sync to the soundtrack and it was, it was being a problem. And the, um, the art director came over to me and pointed him out on the playback and said, uh, is there anything we can do about this guy? Because, you know, he's really kind of not hitting it. And I said, okay, just give me a couple minutes and I'll see what I can do. And so I went to the puppeteer and I said, okay, so how are you, how are you functioning? How are you doing this? And he's like, well, I'm just listening to it. I'm trying to hit the, hit the words. And I said, well, you know, instead of just listening to it and trying to hit the words, why don't you, the puppeteer, sing with the track? Mm. Because we're not doing sound, it's all gonna be added in post because you know there's no dialogue or anything. Mm -hmm. I said, sing along with this music while you're trying to puppeteer. And that way, that natural connection that you normally have with your puppet is gonna exist. Instead of, mm -hmm. I'm listening to a thing and trying to remotely control a guy, and the very next take, he got it. Hmm. You know, well, I, I, you and I have had conversations about how one of the hardest things to do as a puppeteer is to lip sync a puppet. Yeah. It's, it's much easier to speak and, and operate the puppet at the same yeah. time. Because they're, they're, when, you're, when you're doing it to a track, when someone's playing something like dialogue and you're trying to match the lips um, action, unless you have a lot of practice with it, there's a natural time delay. You know, you're, you're, the soundtrack is gonna happen, you're gonna hear it, and then you're gonna activate your arm to make it move. And for some people, it's like almost a second. And, and it's, it's very difficult. Um, a lot of the theme parks operate that way. They play a soundtrack and the puppeteers have to puppeteer to that, but they drill them and so, they are, in fact, anticipating and moving before the actual soundtrack plays because they have to, they have to take care of that time lag. It's just, it's kind of a weird uh, thing with puppetry, but it's gotta happen. It's a lot easier to do it, to do it live, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I, at this point, uh, want to give folks here in the audience an opportunity to ask Gordon questions. So I'm just throwing it out there that uh, if you do have any questions for 2015 Guest of Honor, Mr. Gordon Spooner. Oh look, I scared people away. That's great. Uh, somebody's <laughs> raising a puppet in the back. What's your question? What is your inspiration for like, you know, the look and who and how? So, so the question is, what is your inspiration for building a puppet, basically, or creating a, look, a character? A look. Yeah, yeah. Character you're, you're asking about the art design aspect yeah, of it? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, with, like the little guy that you got, um, when I do puppets for shows, when I, when I go to a com <laughs> comic book show or what have you, and we're selling puppets across the table in Artist Alley, I have a set of standard patterns that I just use, and then I will redecorate those basic frameworks in different character styles. Um, I found that fantasy characters sell really well. Um, dragons always sell well. Um, the, I have, a, I have a, a kind of a pseudo standard design that I call the crazy dude. Um, and he's just really a sock puppet with wild eyes and kind of shock of crazy hair. Um, and those sell well. Um, but I do sit down every so often and I'll just take a drawing pad and excuse me, try to think of new ways to work with the parts that are easy for me to manufacture. So, I mean, your guy there, his nose is a little pillow. I mean, it's it's a it's a two-sided, you know, fabric thing with stuffing inside. Um, and you can you can do a lot with different shapes 
Um, you know, you want a kind of a bulbous nose, but so is it round or is it oval shaped? And if it's oval shaped, is it horizontal or is it vertical? Um, can you, you know, you can do uh, kind of a triangular shaped nose and if you put the point upward, it's kind of human looking. If you put the point downward, it's kind of animal looking. Uh, you know, and so if you have that, you, you put the point downward, um, you can turn that puppet into a doggy or a kitty or a bear or a mouse, you know, any kind of sort of mammal creature with a, with a you know, triangular nose. Um, so I, I, you know, I'll play around with things on a sketch pad. Um, one of the things I particularly like doing is playing with eye, eye design because eyes are, are vitally important for a character. Um, you know, I was talking in, in one of my earlier panels about how um, it's eyes and mouth that make a, make a puppet, that those are the major themes in a, in a puppet face. So, um, you know, many puppets have no nose at all, and, you know, but every puppet usually has a pair of eyes and a mouth because that's the fun part. Um, that's what we relate to. So, um, I'll sit down and I'll just start drawing circles and try to figure out new combinations of things. Um, I like playing with bags under the eyes. I like playing with big bushy eyebrows and eyelids and that sort of thing, um, just to, to give some character. Um, you know, you'll, know, you'll notice that little fellow has two different sized eyes. Yes. And uh, that's something I enjoy doing too, is giving them just a little kind of wonkiness with the, you know, one eye is a little smaller than the other eye. Um, but, um, uh, oh, uh, yeah, um, inspiration-wise, um, I also love working with other artists. Uh, so this year, I uh, contacted David Peterson, who is the artist of a comic book called Mouse Guard. And he's very popular, and uh, he does really beautiful artwork. So uh, I talked with him, and he's a puppet fan. He loves puppets. And I said, so how about if I set you loose and you design a character? It doesn't have to be from your comic book. It could be anything you want to put out there. And then I'll take that design of that character and we'll do a limited edition run of 10 puppets of that character. And then that'll be our 2015 artist-inspired puppet offering. And we'll sell those and we'll split some money and everybody will be happy. And so he was very excited about that. Um, and what he actually sent me uh, some scribble kind of sketches, uh, which in David speak is actually, you know, I mean, if you actually see his artwork, he, he sent me scribbles. What he actually sent me were uh, four portraits of different character types that he thought would be fun that actually were colored and <laughs> they weren't inked, but they were colored. Uh, and so he said, okay, you pick out of those four and then I'll develop that a little farther. And uh, so I picked this kind of pig looking guy because he looked like a lot of fun to make. And so David did a couple of other iterations of that character and finally came up with this really cool um, sort of porcine guy. And he's like sitting there and he's eating fish. Uh, you know, he's got like this long kind of uh, um, kind of fraggle tail, and, and so uh, I, I started working on those, and we made those available uh, at Heroes Con in uh, South Carolina, South Carolina, North Carolina, the Carolinas. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, North and South Carolina, I confuse you. <laughs> I confuse North and South Dakota too, so it's okay. They both they both seceded from the union. It does not. Yeah. Actually, that's not true. <laughs> um, but so uh, the, the first one off the table went to artist Michael Golden, who is one of my favorite comic book artists of all time, uh, and uh, he was very excited. So actually after this convention, we're going to be shipping that to Michael uh, so that he'll have that puppet in his house. Because one, one of those puppets is on display in the art show, right? One of those puppets yeah. is on display in the art show. Um, <clears throat> this kind of big dude is, is sitting on the table with the rest of them. Um, yeah, so if, if that goes well, maybe next year I'll, we'll find another artist that we admire and hopefully get them to do a character design. And, and now there's hands in the air. Now there's hands and the first one was over here, so I'm going to go over here. Um, can you talk a little bit about puppet preservation? I'm just curious, like, how susceptible are puppets to the ravages of time 
what are some of the coolest puppets that we've lost to history and some of the coolest that we've actually kept around and can still see? Um, puppet preservation. Well, as you know, puppets are an endangered species. Uh, so I highly encourage everyone to donate to the Puppet Preservation Society. Uh, hashtag Herman. Hashtag Herman Show. <laughs> uh, but no, um, conservation of our stretch goals. Yeah. Conservation of puppets is really tough because uh, what happens with a puppet is that it's a performing tool. It is not, it's not a piece of art that you create and then put in a glass case and try to keep the elements from touching it. Um, puppets are used. Uh, it's, it's like trying to conserve a pair of jeans that you're going to wear. Um, it's, it's, over time, they're just going to wear out. Um, and I know that uh, uh, most of them have, well, not most of them, I can, puppets is such a broad term, I have to, come, I have to start saying television puppets or something. Um, Muppety kind foam of based puppets. foam based puppets. Um, the moment that urethane foam is manufactured, it starts breaking down. It just does because the atmosphere is attacking it. Um, oxygen uh, uh, breaks it down, um, ozone breaks it down, sunlight breaks it down. Um, so, one of the things that I tell everybody when they're buying puppets from me is you're going to be tempted to display your puppet. And that's fine. What you want to do is put it on a stand or something, you know, pose it, do whatever you want to do, but keep it out of the sun. And that's, that's tough because sunlight makes everything look so beautiful. You know, you get a puppet and you put him in the window and he's got sunlight streaming from behind him and, you know, he's luminescent and beautiful and lovely. And, and you're, you're killing him. And you're destroying that puppet. Um, the sun will make it fade and the sun will attack the foam. Um, and uh, UV will attack the foam. Um, foam, when it, when it breaks down, um, the puppeteers have started calling it toast because it tends to get brittle and kind of crunchy. Um, and I know that um, the New York Museum, I think it was, just recently did a big Henson thing and uh, the Henson company just kind of handed over a bunch of the old Muppet puppets that they had and there was nobody there to help them. So the conservators at the museum had to figure out how to preserve these things. And they had never dealt with anything like it ever before. Um, the first thing that happened was they didn't understand why the, the Swedish chef puppet didn't have any hands. <laughs> so they were trying to figure out what to do with that. And, but they also, they also had to rebuild some of the interior structures because they had just completely disintegrated. So um, at one point, the, uh, oh, that was, that was the thing. The Swedish chef doesn't have any kind of like body pod inside. He's just kind of a bag. And so how do you display that? And so the, the conservators actually built like a human chest that they put underneath the puppet. And of course, that completely changes the lines of what he looks like. So suddenly, you know, he's got He-Man, you know, <laughs> Swedish chef He-Man. And uh, someone from the Muppet people came over and went, no, that's really wrong. That's just wrong. Um, but um, Furry is at that stage. Furry is at that stage. Uh, furry actor monster. Um, I, I brought him out last night. We were, we were actually walking through the hallways and someone had put, uh, the GPS had put up a wanted poster with a picture of Furry. And it was part of their little game that they were doing in their party room. And uh, I said, you know, I've got furry upstairs. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go up and let's go up and grab him, and we're gonna tear this poster off the wall, and we're gonna go into GPS, and furry's gonna demand to know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and was there a video camera? There was not. I would have recorded that, man. But uh, so Fur furry came in and demanded to know what was going on, and said, I want to know what this is about. I don't care about the wanted poster. It's those damn Google eyes somebody put on it. <laughs> and. Uh, I need to find. I need to find out who decided Furry needed to be put in jail, because that was their part of their game. Was you know people would come in and put stickers. Five people must have said it. Five five people said Furry belonged in jail. 
and uh, four or five people said that you didn't. I didn't yeah. even know that I had. How no, many blue I, stickers were on it? There were. I like said there were four green stickers and five red stickers. So he he just barely been aged <laughs> out. But uh, so, <laughs> so, so it, yeah. So he's toast. Uh, it, when I when I I brought the puppet out, I hadn't had him on my hand in months, and it, it really. When I put my hand inside furry, it, it really struck me that I need to rebuild that puppet. Mm -hmm. um, the foam thing that's inside his head is just, it's nearly gone. Um, it's very, very, very loose and floppy. And, and uh, the, the inside where, where my thumb rests on the bottom palette has completely worn through the foam. There's like a hole. And I can, I can touch the outside fabric with my thumb. Uh, luckily, he's furry, so you don't really notice it. but. Uh, yeah, I, I do intend on rebuilding Furry because uh, he, he deserves it. Yeah. <laughs> you, never, you never forget your first puppet. Not that that was your first puppet. But. Well, it, it, he'll he'll get he'll be, get put in an anti-acid cardboard box and stored away, and, and uh, then someday when I'm really famous, we'll have him in the archives. Donate him to the puppetry center in Atlanta. Smithsonian or something. Yeah. Yeah. All right. A uh, couple more questions uh, we have time for. We'll start up here and then. Yeah. Um. First, really quick, what are you going to do with the old furry? And uh, secondly, have you ever got the urge to build any popular characters in puppet form, like the Avengers or uh, political figures? Um, uh, uh, as I mentioned, when, when, when furry gets retired, he'll be put into a box and, and stored away um, just for archive's sake. Uh, as far as producing other popular characters, um, I have done Earsat's versions of Rocket Raccoon. Oh my god. But I don't, you know, I don't call him Rocket Raccoon, I call him Space Raccoon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Don't want to infringe on copyright. How this, much was the Taj when they're going up for sale? Uh, well I, I made some I made some smaller version puppets other than just the little sock puppet version and, and those went for sixty apiece. Uh, just you know, and that was I I did a limited run. They were actually far more trouble to make than they were really worth, but it was good to have them at a convention so that people, you know, really visit the table. Um, yes, uh, if it, if it comes to uh, other puppet characters, I do not do replicas of famous puppets. Uh, there are guys who do, and there's one guy in particular who will remain nameless that uh, does actual replica ripoff Muppet puppets. Um, Disney has has provided him with a cease and desist order, and if he bugs them too much more, they're going to take him to court. Um, people get really, really possessive about their favorite fan property, and uh, the Muppets are one of those things that, number one, everybody thinks that they can do Kermit better than Steve Whitmire, um, which may be true, but <laughs> but guess what? For a few of those people. Yeah, but guess what? Steve Whitmire has a contract. That's his job, and he's going to be doing Kermit until he dies. Um, he's not getting fired. He's not getting replaced. He is Kermit the Frog now, so we really need to accept that. Um, but um, you, you run into folks, and this is, they may not say it out loud, but the subtext to everything that they say to you is, but I love the Muppets so much. I should be able to own them. And that's not creepy. That's so you find out how much Disney paid for them, and you're going to right. pay them more than that, yes. and then you can. Own yes. Them. But, uh, um, the, but the, I'm the, sorry, I, if you do that, Mr. Trump, you won't be able to run for president. So <laughs> but the, the, the thing is, is that the Muppets are a, an intellectual property, just like Spider Man, just like uh, a Superman, just like Mickey Mouse. And if you start operating as though you own those rights and you don't, someone is going to sue you. And in extreme cases, you may actually go to jail. Uh, you know, I, I run into people all the time who are confused about intellectual property. And they seem to think that, you know, if, I, if I'm making a Kermit the Frog puppet and I'm selling those, since it's not exactly like Kermit the Frog, the real Kermit the Frog, it's my interpretation. And so I should be able to do that. And the fact is, no. If someone walks up to you on the street and can identify that puppet as Kermit the Frog, that means that you are infringing on someone's copyright. 
Um, you know, the, uh, you go down the street in New York, and if someone tries to sell you a, 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 a Rolex watch, um, and it's not a Rolex watch, they're breaking the law. The law, you know, it, you know, even even if they misspell the word Rolex on the, on the face of the dial, they are infringing on copyright or intellectual property. That's um, really unfortunate because I was going to suggest you a character called Captain Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's Captain Canuck, and <laughs> others like him, um, but yeah, so. Yeah, we just, just got time for a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah go ahead, sir. Um, so I, there are arguably as many adult nature cartoons on television today as are kids' cartoons, mm -hmm. um, but for adult puppet um, television, Mongols in the UK had a couple of seasons, I think, too. Amazing show, but it's like, why why cartoons are acceptable for adults to watch, but puppets just can't seem to break in the way they did before? Um, I think it's a matter of time, and it's a matter of having a champion. Um, the uh, uh, animation Animation has been on TV almost since the start. Um, animation was in the theaters almost <laughs> since the start. And so over time, we have allowed ourselves to acclimate to animation. Um, I mean, originally, you know, the old Tom and Jerry cartoons and that sort of thing played in theaters, and they weren't, they weren't considered kitty fair. They were for everybody, uh, including adults, and adults could enjoy them just, just fine. Um, it was only, uh, for a while, animation became just kid stuff. And that's too bad because animation is a very, very versatile medium, as are puppets. Uh, I think it's just going to take some time and some concerted effort to get adults to be comfortable sitting down and just watching puppet stuff. I mean, pretty much everybody in this room is, you know, high minded enough that we can, you know. I'll, you know, I'll watch it all. I don't care. I'll watch. I'll watch a kitty show. I'll watch you know, Crank Yankers. I'll watch all of it because I enjoy watching puppet entertainment. Um, one of the things that we need to get past is the medium is the message. So as much as I love Greg the Bunny, it was all about puppets being puppets because we need the reassurance that we're not being fooled. Um, I want to produce puppet entertainment where the puppets are secondary in the thought process. I want to tell stories with characters. The fact that they're being portrayed by puppets, that's just the medium I've chosen. Um, and that's, that's the graduation. I think animation has kind of reached that point. Um, uh, the, the, the example that I use is, um, Adults, for some reason, they feel like they need to keep reminding you that they're puppets. So they make handhold jokes and they make, you know, real lowball humor. Um, and uh, if I was reading a novel and the writer reminded me every five pages that what I was doing was reading a novel and that this was a book and that I was reading words on a page and not actually watching a show or, or, or experiencing a play, I would get really pissed because that's interrupting the narrative. It's not telling me a story, it's calling my attention to the medium. And I don't want that. I, I, I know it's a book, for Christ's sake. I'm reading it, ain't I? <coughs> um, you know, if, it, it's on, if it's on Kindle, maybe you can't tell. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, we, we, uh, we're almost, we are out of time, but I want to get to the questions here. So yeah, go ahead. I, I actually have two questions. You might answer my second one. Anyway, the first one is, how many puppets have you made? And number two is, are you ever been attached to any certain puppet that you have sold? And I think that you answered that one, but I wasn't sure. Um, yes. Um, you know, the, the, the thing is, I, I've made hundreds of puppets. I, 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 and I haven't kept count. Okay. Um, we've, we figured out that if you include the little finger puppets we made, we're probably closer to 4,000, but it's wow. probably over 200 big puppets. Yeah. And, uh, um, yes, there have been puppet characters that I, I was very attached to that I built specifically for sale. And um, 
I have to convince myself that when I let my babies loose into the world, they're on their own. Uh, uh, one of the worst things that can happen to a puppet builder is uh, building a beautiful puppet and then handing it off to a really crappy puppeteer mm -hmm. and watching your work be manipulated very poorly. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I've, I've had to, I, I really have had to divorce myself from that. Um, but the, one, one of my favorites that I built was, um, uh, I called him a kobold. He was uh, made out of some kind of cream colored fur. But he was, he was very cool. And I really, really liked the way this puppet turned out. And had I not specifically built him for sale, I would have kept him myself. But uh, he ended up going to a good friend of ours out of Chicago, and she, I know he's being taken very well care of, uh, very, taken very good care of, I don't know, how are you It's really early, early, we're sorry. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, but, uh, you know, like characters, characters like I built for Transylvania Television, I'll never sell any of those puppets, because um, not only are they important to the property, but they're um, uh, romantically important to me. Uh, as a, a, a nostalgia and a, a, a proof of my work sort of thing, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, all right, one final question, because Bill had that question. Oh, no, yeah. it's rather esoteric, and it's not. All right, never mind the esoteric <laughs> question. I think, uh, yeah, we have reached our time. So, once again, Gordon, thank you for being the guest of honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed your convention oh. weekend. And, uh, oh, I, oh, I yeah. forgot. I forgot. Um, so, something else that I did. Um, I built Kevin Smith's Batman gun for Mall Rats. Sweet. I, 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 I do have a few, a few extra vermin uh, Kickstarter ribbons, yeah. by the way, uh, if you haven't gotten one yet.